Hello, welcome to our webinar on Interstellar. I'm Flora Zhu, a sophomore from Great Neck South High School in New York City. I am a student volunteer for the Planet Plus AI program. I'll be your moderator today. Our speaker today is Dr. Avi Loeb, a professor from Harvard University. Dr. Avi Loeb received a PhD in plasma physics at age 24 from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and was subsequently a long-term member at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where he started to work in theoretical astrophysics. In 1993, he moved to Harvard University, where he was tenured three years later. He is now Frank B. Baer, Jr., Professor of Science and former chair of the department. Dr. Loeb will give us a presentation on his new book, Interstellar, and his team's recent expedition. This event will be recorded and will be available online after the end of our webinar. Please meet yourselves before our presentation. We welcome and encourage you to ask questions for our speaker today. To submit your questions, please enter them anytime in the chat. Our speaker will answer your questions as time permits. Dr. Loeb, I'll give it to you. Thank you so much for hosting me and I would encourage you to think about questions. Uh, I will allocate uh, 15 minutes uh, at the end um, to address your questions. So let me share my screen and we'll start um, the presentation. Uh, there seems to be background noise from one of you. I'm not sure who. If you could mute yourself. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, I just uh, published um, a couple of weeks ago, the book uh, Interstellar, which uh, discusses the implications for humanity of finding an object that entered the solar system from outside and uh, was manufactured technologically by an advanced civilization different than ours. And um, um, in this talk, I will discuss uh, some of the research I've been doing to search for such uh, objects. Um, in the past 70 years, we searched for radio signals which is just like uh, listening and waiting for a phone call at home. Um, nobody may call you when you are listening if you're listening for a short period of time. Uh, but another approach, which is completely different that was not attempted, is to check um, uh, for any packages that arrive to our mailbox or uh, is in our backyard. And that's a completely different approach because uh, we launched uh, um, about five uh, probes to interstellar space. Uh, over the past 50 years. And um, uh, other civilizations had uh, billions of years to do that before us because most stars form billions of years before the sun. And it takes less than a billion years for our spacecraft to traverse the Milky Way galaxy as a whole. So they could have, other civilizations could have arrived uh, at our doorstep by now. And we haven't checked until the last decade for interstellar objects. So that's a new frontier. And the first two interstellar objects, as I'll mention, appear unusual. They do not look like uh, the rocks that we are familiar with uh, in our solar system. So all of this research is a part of the Galileo project that I established uh, a couple of years ago. And this is a team uh, uh, photo. Um, we have uh, assembled an observatory at Harvard University that is monitoring the sky 24 seven, looking uh, for objects uh, that are not necessarily uh, natural, not uh, birds uh, and are not necessarily human made like uh, balloons, drones, airplanes. We want to see if there is anything else. And the reason is uh, because the US government talks about unidentified anomalous phenomena uh, at least a few percent of them are not uh, identified and they cannot figure them out. And uh, from a scientist's point of view, if, if even if only one in a million objects in the sky is extraterrestrial from outside of this earth uh, and is technological, that would change the future of humanity. So we want to see by systematically surveying the sky if there's anything like that. So let me um, show us a brief uh, video that describes um, the instruments we have in this first observatory that is already functioning and we're starting to collect data now. Oh. 
Welcome to an overview of the Galileo Project's development site, codenamed Pigeon Run. Our instrumentation suite consists of both wide field and narrow field sensors. Wide field sensors are used for target selection and tracking, while narrow field sensors gather higher resolution data on potentially anomalous objects. Our main instrument is DALEC, a hemispherical array of eight infrared cameras. Next to it is the Alcor, a secondary high resolution optical all sky camera. Together, these instruments continuously monitor and track objects in the sky, analyzing them in real time for potential anomalous activity. This is AMIS, our acoustic monitoring omnidirectional system designed to detect and record acoustic signatures across the infrasonic, audible, and ultrasonic bands. AMIS also houses an ADS-B antenna for logging aircraft transponder data, allowing us to quickly separate known from unknown objects. Here we have Skywatch, a multi-static passive radar system designed to detect and track multiple objects simultaneously, measuring object positions and kinematics. And Pac-Man is an environmental monitoring system for measuring local weather conditions. Sensors include an anemometer, temperature and pressure sensors, a particle counter, and a flux gate magnetometer. Next up is Spectre, a radio spectrum analyzer with a wide band antenna for measuring radio and microwave emissions. Beacon is currently our only narrow field instrument. Beacon is a high resolution pan tilt zoom camera capable of 40 times optical zoom. Our instruments collect a wide range of data, all of which is fed to our computing enclosure housed beneath the Dalek and Alcor instruments. Here, data is processed and analyzed in real time. Objects detected and tracked by the wide field instruments are localized in 3D space and analyzed for unusual characteristics. Selected targets are then sent to the Beacon PTZ for follow-up observation. Finally, data is recorded to disk to the cloud via Starlink. These combined systems comprise the current version of the observatory class system with many refinements, additions, and upgrades scheduled for near-term implementation at Pigeon Run. So this is a brief summary of the first uh, observatory, and we plan to make additional copies of it. The first one is uh, apparently assembled in Colorado, and um, we plan to make uh, more cameras uh, so that we can triangulate um, um, the distance to uh, an object in the sky and figure out its size and speed uh, properly. And we are considering various sites uh, to put these observatories. And, of course, the number of such observatories will depend on the funding that we get. We also are using uh, satellite data to look at objects from above, not just from below. And that is uh, data from Planet Labs, uh, uh, which has uh, a set of uh, satellites, hundreds of them uh, orbiting the Earth. So altogether, we um, are building hardware. We are uh, uh, collecting the data and placing it uh, on the cloud and then analyzing it with machine learning software. Uh, and so eventually this, uh, the software that we develop will be trained on enough uh, objects that it will be automated and uh, no human intervention will be needed except when it identifies something unusual. We have eight papers that describe the, uh, the system that we currently employ. Uh, my interest in this subject started with an object uh, that was discovered by astronomers back in 2017 uh, using a telescope in Hawaii that was searching for near-Earth uh, objects. And uh, on October uh, 19th, 2017, it identified an object that came uh, within a distance that is one-sixth of the Earth-Sun separation. Um, and... Uh, they flagged it uh, as a near-Earth object, but then realized that it's moving faster than needed to uh, remain bound to the sun. So it was faster than the escape speed from the solar system, and therefore it must have arrived from outside the solar system. This was the first reported interstellar object. And uh, I was surprised because a, a decade earlier, I predicted that based on what we know about rocks in the solar system, there couldn't be a large enough population of rocks uh, that are the size of a football field, which was the size of this object, um, coming from other stars for 
this telescope in Hawaii to detect one of them. Uh, so that was intriguing because when uh, you make a, an incorrect uh, forecast, um, you realize that it's an opportunity to learn something new. Uh, and um, as we took more data, the community of astronomers on this object, it appeared more and more different than the rocks that we are familiar with in the solar system. For example, the amount of light uh, that was reflected from it changed by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling every eight hours. And it had a, based on the reflection of sunlight, it had a flat shape, a pancake-like. Um, and uh, that's unusual. Uh, but moreover, it was pushed away from the sun by some mysterious force that declined inversely with distance squared. And it, it didn't show any evaporation, uh, any cometary tail, no gas or dust around it. So there couldn't have been a rocket effect pushing it. And the question was, what is the force pushing it? And I suggested that it may be the reflection of sunlight. And um, for that, uh, to be effective, the object had to be very thin, uh, like a sail. And uh, there are light sails that are currently being studied for uh, interstellar, for travel, or or even travel within the solar system. So nature doesn't make such things. And I suggest it may be artificial in origin. Maybe it's a, a surface layer of a bigger object that was torn apart. And um, um, of course, uh, that uh, was inconclusive. We didn't get enough uh, evidence on this object. Uh, but uh, three years later, there was another object that showed the push away from the sun as a result of reflection of sunlight with no cometary evaporation. This object was given the name 2020 SO, detected by the same telescope in Hawaii. But within a few weeks, the astronomers realized, oh, this one actually, if you trace it back, it was a rocket booster that was launched by NASA in 1966. And it's made of stainless steel and has thin walls. So that's why it had a large area for its mass and uh, was pushed by reflecting sunlight. So we know that this one, 2020 SO, was artificial because we made it. The question is who made Oumuamua? And uh, a couple of years, a year and a half after Oumuamua was discovered, uh, I was interviewed on the radio about uh, a meteor uh, near Kamchatka. Uh, and um, I checked uh, online for a catalog of meteors and I found uh, a catalog uh, compiled by NASA that included 273 meteors with uh, measured velocities. So I asked my student, Amir Siraj, uh, who was an undergraduate at the time, I said, why don't we check if any of these meteors uh, has a, a speed relative to the sun that allows it to, to escape from the solar system. So it came from outside. Uh, and in, we found a meteor from January 8th, 2014. And um, after the US government confirmed it, uh, I decided to lead an expedition to search for the materials from this meteor. And uh, we did have that expedition and uh, it was uh, in June this year for two weeks between June 14th and 28th uh, on a ship called the Silver Star. So, and I wrote uh, 43 diary reports on medium.com, which you're welcome to, to look at. Uh, there were a few million around, uh, people around the world who read those reports and uh, they were translated to Spanish. So let me show you a few um, pictures from uh, uh, the, the trip on that ship, um, Silver Star. <laughs> Thinking I am 
So um, um, it all started um, with um, uh, the identification of this um, meteor, but then when we submitted the paper uh, in 2019, uh, it was not published because my colleagues argue that they don't believe the data from the US government. And uh, it took three years for me to convince uh, people within government to um, check the data. And a letter was issued by the United States Space Command under the Department of Defense uh, to NASA saying that uh, they confirmed the 99.999% confidence that this uh, meteor came from outside the solar system. It's interstellar. And at that point, uh, I decided to lead the expedition um, to the meteor site. The government also provided um, the light curve of the fireball from the explosion of this object. It had three flares uh, separated by roughly a tenth of a second from each other. But the important point is the object only disintegrated at the stress from uh, its friction with air that was far greater than all other meteors in the catalog, 272 of them. So we can say that it had material strength larger than even iron meteorites. And uh, the question is, well, if it's uh, moving very fast, in fact, we calculated that outside the solar system, it was moving at uh, faster than 95% of all stars in the vicinity of the sun relative to the local standard of rest. It was moving at 60 kilometers per second outside the solar system. So if it's moving fast and it has an unusual material strength, perhaps it's a Voyager like a meteor. Imagine our own spacecraft Voyager uh, colliding with a planet far away after it's not uh, functional anymore. Uh, it would appear as a meteor of unusual material strength and unusual speed. And to find out what the composition of this object is, we went uh, to the Pacific Ocean. Now, the error budget uh, that the government provided uh, uh, provided it had this um, site of the fireball um, localized within um, seven miles or so, 11 kilometers. You can see it as the box here. And that's a large region for us to survey. So what we um, found is a seismometer data on Manus Island in Papua New Guinea that recorded uh, the uh, sound wave from the explosion. And just like with uh, a thunder, uh, you can see the lightning before uh, the sound arrives to you because the speed of sound is slower than the speed of light, uh, we could then um, figure out the distance of this explosion based on the time delay between the sound and the light. And so that uh, narrowed down the path of the meteor to this uh, strip that you see in red here um, at a fixed distance from the seismometer. And this is a group uh, photo of the 28 people that came for uh, the trip. Um, we Behind us, you see what's called an A-frame that um, was important because we had a cable connecting a sled that we built uh, that had magnets on both sides. Uh, and we the cable um, allowed the sled to be on the ocean floor we were looking for the molten droplets from the surface of this uh, meteor when it was exposed to the immense heat from the fireball that it created as a result of its friction on air. So um, um, we were going back and forth across a region of seven miles. The ocean was more than a mile deep and we were searching for uh, droplets the size of a grain of sand, uh, less than a millimeter in size. It, it sounds like an impossible task to find such things across such a big region. 
So here are some photos. You can see the sled that we design in the middle and right sides. Um, uh, this is a moment where we were uh, pulling it out of the ocean and bringing it to the deck of the ship in order to scrape any materials, magnetic particles that were attached to the magnets. And uh, of course, uh, most of the material was uh, volcanic ash that uh, belongs to Earth. But uh, we were hoping that among the, the black powder that we collected, there might be some uh, spherules. These are the molten droplets from the meteor. And what you see at the bottom uh, left and middle panels is me jogging at sunrise every morning the way I do on land. And we had a filming crew that came with us to the ship, uh, one out of uh, 50 filmmakers and producers that wanted to join us, and I had to select just one. Uh, and uh, in one of the mornings, they decided to film me uh, as I was jogging. And the director asked, uh, Avi, it looks like you're running. Are you running away from something or towards something? And I said, uh, both. I'm running uh, away from some of my colleagues who have very strong opinions about this meteor, and but they are not seeking evidence. And I'm running towards a higher intelligence in interstellar space. So here are some more photos. In the top middle, you see uh, the magnets and they have materials attached to them. And we would uh, uh, strip th that material from the magnets and put it in uh, vials. Uh, we would also use a vacuum uh, cleaner, as you can see in the middle bottom panel, um, to uh, use suction to collect all of the material that we can find on the magnets in every run. And there were 26 runs. We went back and forth crisscrossing this um, region of seven miles in size. And you can see here how the sled was uh, going over the ocean floor. It basically uh, looks like a lone mow mower, uh, except that it was uh, collecting magnetic particles out of this uh, sand that was mostly non-magnetic. And uh, of course, there was a risk that uh, we will not find anything, uh, maybe because the object was not did not have iron, or maybe it didn't produce enough uh, of those magnetic particles for us to find. So um, as you will see, we were quite uh, fortunate in terms of uh, finding what we were looking for. And this video was uh, taken by a camera that was attached to the sled. Um, we couldn't see it in real time, only after we would bring the sled up um, to the deck of the ship and um, extracted the video footage from it. And here we were dragging a piece of rock for the ride. We couldn't really collect it. It was too big. So here are um, the 26 uh, runs that we had. We also had runs far away from the meteor path, which is illustrated in orange here. And the reason we went far away um, is to get a sense of what is the background uh, of spherules and produced by other meteors or other sources. So this is a zoomed in uh, uh, image of the tracks that were closed to the meteor path in orange and the Department of Defense error box. And on the ship, we collected, we, we were looking for, in the first six days, we couldn't really find any spheral. And I actually wrote a diary report on the sixth day asking, where are the spherules? And gladly, a day later, we filtered the volcanic ash, the black powder, and started looking through the microscope at bigger particles. And then we found the first spherule. And I hugged the person who found it. I was really thrilled because I knew from my experience in the kitchen, if you see a single ant, you know that there are many more ants out there. And uh, sure enough, we found 50 spherules, these molten droplets that are the size of a grain of sand uh, on the ship. And here you see one of them uh, where this white arrow is pointing. They look very distinct from the sand that surrounds them. 
And you can see more in this image, smaller ones were much more abundant. And we use the tweezers to pick them up after looking at the material with uh, a microscope. And here you see some images from the microscope on the ship. And they look uh, quite beautiful, these uh, spherules. Uh, my daughter said, uh, after seeing the, these images, she said that she wants me to make, um, to put one of them on a necklace for her to wear. And I had to explain that they are less than a millimeter in size. We cannot thread them. And here is the delivery room of all these uh, spherules that we found. Uh, it's just like babies that they were delivered. Uh, and instead of beds, uh, we put them in vials. And instead of the delivery room, we have them in a white basket that we uh, shipped back home. And um, you see on the left here, the way we were searching for material on the magnets, uh, one of the rainy nights. It was night and day, and I didn't really sleep uh, for more than a few hours at the time because uh, these runs were coming in in the middle of the night. And then uh, once we finished the expedition, I shipped the materials by FedEx to my home, and it arrived a few days after I arrived. But I realized that a few days of a delay is not too much uh, of a delay because uh, the material took billions of years to arrive to Earth. You see the suitcase on the right side with my hands opening it. And uh, we brought it uh, to the laboratory of my colleague Stein Jacobson, who you see on the right here. Um, and he has uh, one of the world, uh, world's best uh, mass spectrometers. On my other side, you see a summer intern that I had this summer, Sophie Bergstrom, and she came to shadow me to write uh, she was aspiring to become a science writer and at some point she said uh, can i help with the science and i said of course and i gave her a pair of tweezers and a microscope in stein's lab and she found the 600 new spherules so 10 times more than on the ship out of the materials that we brought back and all together by now we have uh, about 700 of them and Stein said that he doesn't need any more. That's enough for him to examine. In fact, we studied only 57 so far, and we now hope to, in the coming months, to finish the studying most of the sample. Um, so here are some examples of um, the spherules that Sophie found. And uh, on the first day when we came back um, through San Francisco airport, uh, I made a stop at the University of California in at Berkeley, they have a scanning electron microscope. And we took a picture of the inside of a, a few spherules. And amazingly, we found spheres inside spheres. So it's just like uh, Russian dolls. Um, and the small spheres probably condensed very quickly when the explosion took place. And then they were engulfed by iron that glued them together. And here you see them, they look like eggs nested on a background of dendritic, dendritic material. And you can see here many more of them, the tiny spheres inside the big sphere. So when I um, came back to Harvard, I asked my postdoc, uh, Laura Domini, to make a map of the survey region and what she did is split the region into pixels, each of which is about half a kilometer in size. And then um, we had 26 runs that crisscrossed uh, that region with two of them very far away. So what you see left is uh, she mapped the spheral yield. And that means the number of spheres that we retrieved uh, divided by the amount of mass that was retrieved uh, from the background, from the volcanic ash. And that was um, a good way to calibrate the areas that had more yield of spherules. And those are the yellow region, uh, regions that you see. They're roughly twice uh, in yield of spherules per unit mass than uh, the purple regions that characterize the background. You can see the faraway runs at the background. 
And then near the meteor path, which is in orange, you see these yellow, three yellow regions, which may represent actually the three flares that uh, the US government satellites noticed. And uh, you can see a zoomed in uh, version of, of this map on in the middle. And um, there are three runs in particular, run 13, 14, and four that went through the yellow regions. And we found in these runs, we found a special type of spheros that is not found anywhere. So aside from knowing that there is an excess of spherols um, near the meteor path, the expected meteor path, we also found a very unusual composition of some spherols in those yellow regions. So here are images taken at Stein's uh, lab. Uh, this is one of the spheros that looks like a soccer ball. And here is another that looks like a merger of three spheres. And uh, they didn't, they solidified after the merger before they had a chance to become a spherical object. And when we analyzed the uh, composition, and this, this one was from a yellow region. So uh, Stein decided to analyze it first. And then he found this uh, very unusual uh, abundance pattern. Um, and he came to me and said, I mean, he expected to see things that are familiar, but he said, this was never seen in the scientific literature and we need to give it a new name. And what you see here in this plot is on the horizontal axis at the bottom, you see the periodic table starting from lithium on the left and going all the way to uranium on the right. And the vertical axis uh, represents the abundance relative to the standard solar composition. So a value of one represents a material that made up the solar system. And uh, what you see is that in this particular spheral, there are elements with abundances that are hundreds of times more than the solar system standard. For example, beryllium is 300 times more. Lanthanum is uh, about 500 times more. And uranium is somewhere between 600 times more or up to a thousand in some, some other spheros. So altogether, we gave it the name Belau for beryllium, lanthanum, uranium being the having such a, a very high overabundances. And here you see five of those spherules in the yellow regions uh, superimposed. But now the abundance pattern is plotted versus uh, the volatility of an element. So elements on the right-hand side uh, are volatile, meaning that they can be lost uh, by evaporation during an airburst, uh, during an explosion. And um, so indeed, when we look at the abundance pattern of these Belau spherules, we see that these elements are, oops, are absent, uh, they are depleted, and their abundances uh, dive uh, below the solar system abundances, even though other elements are way above. So uh, that is a testimony to the fact that these uh, spherules came from an airburst, from an explosion because the volatile elements were lost. So it came from space, not from the ground. And uh, the question is what uh, could result in such a uh, abundance pattern? And uh, one plausible uh, way to get it is if you have a planet that has a magma ocean where the rock is molten and um, uh, some elements may uh, sink to the core because they have affinity to iron. So if there is an iron core, it will attract some elements and uh, the others will stay behind in the crust. Those are the elements that we see enhanced. But the abundance pattern does not match what you can find in the earth, even though the earth started as a magma ocean with an iron core uh, as a result of collisions, uh, bombardment by very heavy objects one of which created the moon. So the moon also started as a magma ocean and so did Mars. But what we find in terms of abundance of elements does not match uh, what you see in the crust of the earth, the moon or Mars 
or in asteroids. So we argue that it's likely it was or it originated most likely from a, a planet outside the solar system. Um, and then, of course, um, you can say, oh, well, maybe it's not natural. Maybe it's uh, it was uh, manufactured technologically because and one astronomer told me, you know, maybe uh, lanthanum and uran and, and lanthanum and molybdenum are enhanced because they're used as substrates of um, semiconductors. And obviously, uranium can be used as fuel in fission reactors. So uh, it could also be that there was some technological reason for selecting, enhancing those elements. But we, we don't know just from the composition. Uh, and it's most uh, natural to imagine that the origin was planetary. Uh, uh, and But the way to figure it out, whether it's technological or or natural, of course, is to find bigger pieces of the original meteor. And that's what we plan to do in the next expedition. We also looked at the abundances of isotopes uh, of iron and found it to be very different than uh, what you find on Earth. So um, that definitely demonstrates that this, uh, these spheros, the Belau spheros, did not originate on Earth. So altogether, this uh, expedition was risky because there were many failure points, uh, such as uh, we, you know, when I announced the expedition, it required uh, one and a half million dollars. And uh, fortunately, uh, a wealthy individual, a billionaire, contacted me a few months later and said, you have the money. That was uh, Charles uh, Hoskinson. Without that, we wouldn't be able to do that, the mission. Uh, and then even if we were funded, you know, I, I was fortunate to recruit the, the best expedition leaders in the world, the navigators, engineers, that um, are really the, at the top of their profession. And um, that should not be taken for granted, the fact that they decided to join uh, the mission. and. Um, the engineers designed a sled with magnets, and you can imagine circumstances where uh, it wouldn't work. And in fact, in the first day, the sled did not stay on the ocean floor. It was pulled by the cable and was kiting above the ocean floor. And then the engineers figured out that we have to go with the ocean currents to make sure that the sled is on the floor. So, so that was another... Uh, important uh, achievement that we managed to keep the sled on the ocean floor uh, and collect materials. Now, it could have been the case that uh, the meteor would not produce any excess uh, spherules that we will collect because we, the sled was just one meter in width. And we went uh, 26 times across a region that is about 10 kilometers in size. And if the meteor was... Uh, two times smaller, there would be 10 times or eight times less uh, matter uh, produced by the explosion. So we might have not found anything. So it just had the large enough size that allowed us to find these excess spherules of unusual composition. But even if we were to collect materials, you know, it's not obvious that we would have necessarily found those spherules within the large amount of volcanic ash. And then uh, even if we found those ferals, uh, Stein uh, Jacobson could have said, that I'm very busy. I have a team that is working on something else. He was kind enough to uh, allocate all of his resources to the, to the uh, spherals after we brought them back. Uh, and he had this uh, amazing um, uh, mass spectrometer that allowed us to figure out the Belau composition. So all I'm trying to say is that there were many ingredients in this uh, uh, project that had to come together uh, in a successful uh, way so that we would be able to pull it off and, and get the results that we got. And I feel very fortunate. And basically, it shows that um, sometimes in doing science, it's worthwhile taking risks uh, because if you don't search, you will never find anything. So altogether, it's better to be an optimist um, 
in life because life is sometimes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And here we are in this photo with the art right. He, he was the party chief and 85 years old. He was a commander of a destroyer during the Vietnam War and has a lot of experience. All of his expeditions were successful, including this one. And we were standing looking at the sunset at the end uh, of the expedition. And after we retrieved materials, so we had the champagne on the deck and we were discussing the next expedition at that point. And uh, for more details about the implications of finding something interstellar, check out my new book, uh, which has the punchline of the paper, the scientific paper that we wrote uh, just a couple of weeks ago. We submitted it uh, for publication, and we are waiting now for their free reports on it. Thank you very much. I I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Dr. Lowe, for your wonderful presentation. And we really enjoyed it a lot. And of course, we have some questions in the chat. Um, so I read your expedition diary, and you mentioned that like alien technology. So would you please clarify what you mean by alien technology? Right. So just think about ourselves first. That's not alien. That's us. And uh, we sent five probes, uh, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, and New Horizons that will eventually leave the solar system. It will take them 10,000 years to do that uh, because the solar system is very large. It goes out to 100,000 times the Earth-Sun separation. That's the so-called Oort cloud that contains uh, debris from uh, the solar system, the building blocks. Um, so... Um, in 10,000 years, those probes will not be functional anymore. And so the way to think of it is that we are polluting interstellar space. We're throwing trash, you know, that space trash. These objects will not be functional. And, uh, but they are not moving very fast relative to the escape speed of the Milky Way galaxy. So they are moving at tens of kilometers per second and the escape speed from uh, the Milky Way is more like 500 kilometers per second, more than a factor of 10. So, so they are bound by gravity to the Milky Way. And what that means is that anyone else that existed before us, let's say billions of years, because most stars from billions of years before the sun, they, if they sent equipment just like we did, we did it over 50 years. So just think if they had you know, thousands of years of science and technology, maybe millions of years or even a billion years, they would have sent a lot of trash to space. And um, it keeps accumulating over time because all this trash is kept uh, within the interstellar uh, medium, interstellar space. And so the idea here is that every now and then such an object will collide with Earth, okay? And um, you would see it as a meteor, but in fact, it's not a rock. It's a technological object that is not working anymore and just collides with Earth. So just like plastics in the ocean, they keep accumulating over time. And the only way for us to figure it out is by checking what they're made of to make sure that, you know, it's not a rock. Now, um, for every, you know, we detected an interstellar object over the past decade in this catalog of NASA. I calculated that means that we have millions of such objects within the orbit of the Earth around the sun right now. And uh, only you know one of them collides per decade with the Earth because the Earth has a small cross-sectional area. So they are just floating in space. We can't really see them because if they have a size of half a meter or a meter, just like this uh, meteor, they don't reflect enough sunlight for us to detect with the telescopes that we have. So the only way for us to notice them is if they collide with the Earth and burn up in the atmosphere, just like this meteor, but that happens once per decade. Uh, we see an interstellar object for every thousand of solar system rocks. So it's very rare for us to see a, an interstellar object like that. And um, what I mean by an alien technology is simply that the object would be artificially manufactured. So for example, if it, uh, makes these molten droplets, just think about 
um, you know, Voyager being melted. Uh, you know, if you melt uh, stainless steel, it wouldn't look like a rock. If you melt uh, semiconductors or computer screens, uh, what you get is very different because it, they will have a much higher abundance of rare elements. But the best way to tell is by finding pieces of the object, because then you can easily distinguish a rock from a technological gadget. So what I mean by alien technology is something that was manufactured by design. It's not nature that puts together put together some crap, you know, like in the form of a, of a rock uh, that we see everywhere. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so I have another question. I'm quoting from UChicago News by uh, Paul Rand. So a new study from Arizona State University suggests that Oumuamua is a chunk of nitrogen ice knocked from Pluto-like objects that was circling a distant star some half billion years ago. And according to that model, an impact would have sent it trembling out of its own solar system towards ours, so melting along the way to a flat silver, like a bar of soap in the shower. So um, my question is, um, how would you explain that Oumuamua is like not not a um, natural origin, such as like a piece of nitrogen ice modeled by Yeah, So we were actually wrote a paper, took it seriously, this model, and we showed that there is not enough solid nitrogen in the Milky Way galaxy to produce a large population of such uh, chunks so that one of them will collide or will come close to Earth the, the way Oumuamua did. So there is just not enough solid nitrogen in the Milky Way to make in a large enough population of objects. We showed it in a very simple calculation. Even if we were very generous and said, okay, imagine that there are plenty of uh, Pluto-like uh, planets that have solid nitrogen on the surface and you basically crash and, and break all of that solid nitrogen, make objects out of it, and they float in interstellar space even if you take all the nitrogen in them, uh, you just don't get enough, a large enough population such that um, you, we would see a football field size object like Oumuamua uh, every few years. Okay, so that was the point. Uh, and by the way, we've never seen a nitrogen iceberg in the solar system. So here the idea is, Oh, it's not in the solar system. There is no nitrogen iceberg. We'd never see it in the solar system because of the age of the solar system. But somehow you see it coming from interstellar space. It's a rock of a type that we've never seen before in the solar system. But somehow all other stars produce a huge population. Uh, and by the way, it's, it can, they cannot based on the mass budget that I mentioned. So that's one model. There was another model that said the oh, maybe it's a hydrogen iceberg. And there we show that a hydrogen iceberg would not survive the journey. It will evaporate very quickly uh, as a result of absorbing starlight along its journey. And by the way, a hydrogen iceberg cannot be produced in a planetary system like the solar system. It must be produced in a completely different environment like molecular cloud. We don't know. We've never seen evidence for hydrogen icebergs. Never seen that. So once again, people say, oh yeah, it's natural, but it's a rock of a type that we've never seen before. So you can't make a closed case just arguing that what you see is something that was never seen before and it must be natural as a result because we've never seen it. And in fact, we showed in the paper that it would not survive the journey. So um, the authors of that paper agreed with us. They said, okay, yes, we didn't take that into account. And then there was another uh, suggestion. Maybe it's a dust bunny, a collection of dust particles that are very loosely bound. Uh, and, and because of that, it's very fluffy and sunlight is pushing it. And the problem there is that it wouldn't uh, survive coming close to the sun. It would have very low material strength if it's a cloud of dust particles that is 100 times less dense than air, as they suggested. So in the case of a nitrogen iceberg and the hydrogen iceberg, the idea was that uh, there is a cometary tail, but we can't see it. So it's just like the story of Hans Christian Andersen, where the kid says, the emperor has no clothes. In this case, I'm the kid, the emperor is Oumuamua, and no clothes meaning there is no cometary tail that we see. 
And what my these models are saying, oh, no, 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 there is a beautiful cometary tail. You just cannot see it, which is just like the adults were telling the kid, oh, no, the emperor has beautiful clothes. You just cannot see them. And if you want to believe the adults, go ahead. When you don't see the clothes on the emperor, go ahead and say, yes, I agree with you. There are beautiful clothes. This object had a cometary tail. We just cannot see it, which is basically what the nitrogen model says and what the hydrogen model says. If you want to be that kid, fine with me. I do not want to be that kid. When I don't see a cometary tail, I say there is no cometary tail. That's what I say. And the guy from Arizona State University says, that's nonsense. There is a beautiful cometary tail. It's just not visible. And by the way, it's made of a material that we've never seen in any comet ever in the solar system. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And I saw some like really interesting questions in a meeting chat. Um, are you sure that the spherules you collected from the Pacific Ocean are actually the fragments of the 2014 meteor? So um, we found, um, as I showed in, the, the, there was a map that we found an excess number of spherules along the path of the meteor. So um, to me, that shows that we were in the right place because when we compare it to control regions far away, why would we see more spherules just around the path of the meteor, which is what we saw. And the second thing is we found this Belau composition of the spherules in that location. We didn't find it in the control regions. So um, to me, that's another indication that it, it is associated with this uh, meteor. Once again, I'm just using common sense. I say, if there is an excess of spheros, and if we find special spheros that were never seen before in other places on Earth, you cannot find them in the scientific literature, this composition that we are talking about. And here, when I say you cannot find this composition, I mean hundreds of times higher abundance than solar system materials in a variety of elements. There were people that were criticizing our uh, conclusion and saying, oh, of course, we see a lot of different types of spherules. But if you look at the plots that they show, and by the way, there were tweets showing a plot, and the factor was just 10 times more. So the whole point is I'm talking about hundreds of times more. So the, there is a difference between hundreds of times more then 10 times more, even though you say, oh, the plot looks similar, there is some enhancement. Well, but the whole point is hundreds, like think about your bank account. You say you have a certain amount of money and someone has 10 times more. Would you say, oh, it's roughly the same bank account. What's the difference? In both of them, there is money. Well, a factor of 10 is a big factor. You can spend much more money if you have 10 times more. So apparently those colleagues who tweeted about it and showed, here is an example of another uh, meteor where we saw an enhancement. They don't understand that the factor of 10 is a big difference. They just say, oh, there are, you know, there are spherules of all types all the time. And, you know, here, it's not just me. I mean, Stein Jacobson worked in this field for decades, okay? And, uh, you know, he knows the literature extremely well. And he was the one to come to me and say, look, this was never found before. You know, this is something that we need to give a new name because it's not reported in the literature. Okay, so um, have you like eliminated all other possible explanations of natural origin? Oh, no, I didn't. In fact, if uh, you listen to what I said, I said that there is a very possible origin that is natural. And by the way, here we go again. Either reporters or people distort what I say. I say, in fact, I said it explicitly in this presentation, and yet this question came along. I said explicitly that the most natural interpretation is a magma ocean planet. And so the question is, why do you say it's artificial? I don't say that it's artificial. I said it's most likely a magma ocean. And the same happens when I speak to reporters. I tell them exactly the same thing, and then they want to get clickbaits. And so they put a title. Oh, Avi says that uh, this is technological. No, I didn't say that. I say it's most likely a magma ocean from another planet outside the solar system. 
And we are, in fact, I'm now working on a paper trying to um, uh, put numbers into this uh, possibility. There is a challenge there because you need a very large population of objects. So you need roughly 10 to the power 23 uh, rocks like this one, 10 to the power 23 per star in the Milky Way galaxy to get a large enough population such that one of them will collide with Earth every decade. And the mass of this meteor was uh, 500 kilograms. So if you get, if you take 10 to the 23 times 500 kilograms, you get roughly the mass of the Earth. So what you really need is to take a full Earth planet and break it into pieces of 500 kilogram, 10 to the 23 of them, for every star in the Milky Way, billions of tens of billions of stars. Only then you get a large enough population of these rocks such that one of them would collide with Earth every decade. So it needs to be a very common process. And that's the challenge. And uh, I'm saying I'm working on a model that could potentially give those numbers, but we haven't yet demonstrated it. So it's not, if, if there will be a, an Achilles heel or a, a problem with the natural origin, it will have to do with the numbers, the number of such objects that are needed so that one of them will collide with Earth every decade. Half a meter in size, yeah. Thank you. Um, and what's your opinion on Oumuamua? Do you think it's a good discovery? And why do you think so? Well, I it was uh, the first uh, reported object of the size of a football field, and it appeared to be very different than the rocks that we are familiar with. So it's an anomaly. It's an outlier. And, um, you know, the second uh, object that was reported, um, not the meteor, but uh, another object that passed near Earth, happened to be a comet. And it looked just like a comet. So for all these people who say it's a comet of a type that we've never seen before, like a nitrogen iceberg, a hydrogen iceberg, why did the second object that was found by an amateur astronomer, Borisov, why was that just a comet the way we are familiar with? You know, it's it, it reminds me, you go to the zoo and you say, okay, here is a zebra. What is the definition of a zebra? That it, it looks just like your shirt, that it has stripes. Uh, you know, black and white stripes. Okay, you say that's a zebra. Now you look at another animal in the zoo and uh, you say, well, it doesn't have stripes. So maybe it's a zebra of a type that we've never seen before. And I say, no, no, a zebra should have stripes. If it doesn't have stripes, it's not a zebra. Okay, but my colleagues are saying, no, it's a zebra that somehow lost its stripes. And they say, yeah, it's, it's a comet, of, but of a type that we've never seen, a comet that emits invisible matter for us. And then I say, no, it's not a comet. And they say, yeah, it's a comet. But then comes another one, and it looks just like a zebra. So I'm saying, how is that? Like, either it's a zebra or not a zebra, but the definition of a zebra, the definition of a comet is that you can see the dust and, ga and gas around it. That's the definition. And if we don't see it, it's not a comet. You know, you can imagine things that we would not see, of course, but it, you cannot argue that this makes it natural. Okay, thank you. I found a really interesting question. Um, so it says, I was wondering if you could interpret the outlier spiral, spiral in the spot of iron isotope abundances discussed in the presentation. Uh, interpret in terms of where it came from? Yeah. Ah, okay. So uh, as I mentioned, the, you can get it in a magma ocean where some elements that are settling uh, towards an iron core and those that are left behind in the crust, you know, could give rise to this uh, composition that I was talking about. And uh, of, as I mentioned, another possibility is if technologically they were selected. So just like when you build the semiconductor, you select some elements that help you in the design. Um, beryllium and lithium that are very enhanced could have been enhanced because uh, the object was exposed to cosmic rays, much more uh, bombardment by cosmic rays in interstellar space than you find in the inner solar system. And um, you know that um, could be a flag for interstellar travel, the fact that they had 
because beryllium and lithium are produced by spallation, by taking, breaking up uh, heavier nuclei by cosmic rays. So that may be a flag for interstellar travel. Thank you. I have another question. So do you think there will be many more of the same objects like Oumuamua in our solar system? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and I think with uh, the Rubin Observatory that is starting operations in a year in Chile, oh. uh, we should find them um, many more. Uh, you know, every year we'll find a few of them. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Then later, <laughs> like in the future, how are we dealing with them? So, yeah, so then we want to get much more data than we got on Oumuamua because it's now too faint for us to see. So the idea is to look at it with the web telescope and telescopes on Earth. And uh, the web telescope will allow us to detect the heat emitted by the object and figure out its size, the reflectance of sunlight. Um, and moreover, because the web telescope is a million miles away from Earth, it's just like having a second eye and it will allow us to pinpoint the distance to the object and um, figure out uh, its trajectory in three dimensions that very accurately so we can tell if it, it's propelled by anything other than the force of gravity from the sun. All right, Professor, I have a question, please. Okay, uh, we're getting beyond the time limit, so I, I will uh, be glad, okay, to answer uh, one or two more and then I have to go to another thing. Go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so I had been a fan of the hydrogen theory, but after listening to you, I think my opinion was sort of shifting. And I'm starting to believe that maybe it's actually an alien product. I just want to ask that if, say, for example, you have found an object and you prove it to be like 100% alien, you know it's manufactured by other civilizations, what are you going to do with it? Like, oh, besides the significance of finding an alien? That's an excellent question. Uh, so let me make it more specific. Uh, you heard about uh, the asteroid Bennu that um, today um, the OSIRIS-REx mission brought a sample of it back to Earth. Uh, did you hear about it? Yeah. yeah. So just imagine, I mean, this uh, mission landed on the asteroid and collected the sample of material from it. So imagine uh, landing on an interstellar object that came from outside the solar system and, and then seeing that it's a technological object. It's not a rock because it has a label that says made on an exoplanet uh, or uh, it has buttons on it. So I asked uh, my students in class, suppose we, we find a gadget with buttons on it, should we press a button? And uh, half of the class of undergraduates said, uh, no, please don't press any button because it will affect all of us. And uh, the other half said, uh, Please do, because we want to see what would happen. Um, and of course, you know, if we ever land on an object from interstellar space, it will be the decision of the president of the United States whether to press a button. Uh, you know, you can imagine the, 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 the probe uh, landing on it. It doesn't look like a rock the way Bennu looks. I mean, uh, uh, and then you see that there, there are some things on it that you can press. Um, so that'll be amazing, and that's the way I envision, you know, the best outcome of uh, studying interstellar objects. And I wrote about it this morning, actually, because I was interviewed uh, in two television stations about Bennu, and I wrote an essay on Medium.com. So just you can subscribe for free to my essays on Medium.com. Just put Avi Loeb at Medium.com, and you will see the one from this morning about uh, Bennu and the OSIRIS-REx mission as an example. So Dr. Loeb, there's a question from Rohan. This is about the data from your expedition. So he was wondering if you could interpret the our lawyer's feral IS-14 in the plot of iron isotope abundances discussed in your presentation. Oh, right. So, you know, we did um, have spherals from uh, the background that also deviated from, uh, you know, the earth uh, rocks. And that is, you know, obviously because uh, they originated from uh, other meteors. Okay, so there are micrometeorites and other meteors that 
you know, uh, resulted in spherules uh, around the, uh, you know, everywhere. Uh, and that's why we went to background the areas. And obviously, even along the meteor path, it should be a mix of background material plus uh, the meteor. So, yeah, so there is material from outside of this Earth, uh, but it doesn't have the Belau composition because it originated in the solar system. So definitely, you, uh, I mean, the, the isotope uh, ratio that I showed implies that many of these ferals, including the ones in the control regions, came from the sky. They didn't originate on Earth. Thank you, Dr. Loeb. Um, so you've talked a little bit about like the plan of embarking on another expedition, right? Yeah. Um, could you expand a little more, please? Yeah, so we are planning to look for bigger pieces, and um, that will require different equipment, different uh, machinery, and we are now uh, designing it. And hopefully it will take place within the coming year. Okay. It will be more, more expensive, of course, yeah. Dr. Loeb, thank you again for your amazing presentation and, of course, like answering our questions. Thank you all for joining us today. I hope to see you again on our next webinar on Oumuamua. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.